I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to the Bigfoot Breakdown. Today we're going to cover a Sports of Field magazine titled Long Hunter Alaskan Style by Russell Annabelle. Uh, I believe this was published around 1963 and uh, of course, it, the, well, it goes into saying when this was, but uh, let's start this. It says, the story is about Tex Cobb, a mountain man who spent years trapping in Canada and Alaska. The last half of the article reported the Dene Indian people liked him. Tex Cobb, no sentiment was wasted on either side, but he and the tribesmen had a live and let live understanding that was rare in those days. He stayed off their trap lines and they stayed off his. If an Indian had salmon in, uh, had a salmon net in an eddy, Tex found another eddy and vice versa. Due to the fact that the Indians trusted him, we became involved one autumn with what would be called, I suppose, an abominable snowman. An abominable snowman. Um, I have since heard and read a great deal about the abominable snowman. I have seen photographs of those tracks in the snow on the Tibetan mountain, and to me they are simply the tracks of a man with a gunny sack or some other wrapped cloth around his feet for protection in the cold. Um, boy, that's kind of a dismissive way to view tracks when, when some of those photographs are actually pretty good. Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, climbing slew foot because the slope was steep and he had no crampons. But when I was a youngster roaming in, north, in the north with Tex, we had never heard much about Gilyuk, the shaggy cannibal giant sometimes called the big man with the little hat. Our adventure with Gilyuk occurred while we were camped in a pretty spruce park on Yellow Jacket Creek, south of Tyrone Lake. We had spent the entire summer on this mountain, uh, Gert, uh, Nelchina Plateau, wandering and looking for fur sign. Maybe, the, maybe we were. He always had uh, to have an excuse for enjoying the, with the country. Apparently, this guy, Tex Cobb, Tex Cobb, just loved being in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see, where am I at? He always had to have an excuse for enjoying the country, a commercial excuse if he could think of one. Anyway, it was now late September. Apparently, this person talking was the, the companion because it was him, Tex Cobb, and, and this other gentleman. Um, it sounds like it. Yeah. So anyway, it was now late September, uh, the beautiful time, no mosquitoes, land ablaze with color. The fish and the meat animals, summer fat, caribou horde gathering, and we were foot footloose and free as, per as perhaps no man can ever be again. This morning, Tex was making coffee and I was down at the creek cleaning a mess of grayling for breakfast when six Indians filed through the timber. They stood a mo moment solemnly regarding our four horses. To them, a horse was a rarity, a mysterious animal. They called him McKinley Moose because McKinley was the only president they had ever heard of, and the horse, uh, the horses were as big as moose. I followed them to camp. Have you eaten? Tex asked the, them in Denna. They said they had eaten. Chief Stickman was with them. I had seen him once before uh, at at Clinta Village, a squat, square-faced man, very dark with long hair and quick obsidian moving eyes. He was the den of boss of the entire area, and his reputation was bad. He was the, uh, let's see where we at, oops, missed a line. But now he had trouble that he couldn't handle. He told us about it, balancing himself with a moccasin sole of the foot against the knee and then supporting leg. I don't know how, whether it was a bad habit or, or a medicine trick to ward off evil spirits or both. He, it was a disconcerting. Okay. He had come to this area two days ago, he said. Oh, let me move this page up. With some of his people to kill the cache of caribou for winter. But, the, but they had discovered that Gilyuk, the shaggy giant, was hanging around. They found a sign yesterday. And, of course, everybody knew that Gilyuk wasn't interested in caribou. 
Gilliac ate men. What kind of sign, Tex asked. We will take you to see it, Stickman said. It's not far. After breakfast, we followed the Indians upstream a couple of miles to a burned flat on which a nurse crop of aspen and birch had grown. In the center of the flat stood a ruined birch sapling. It had been about four inches through and maybe ten feet tall. Something had twisted the sapling as a man would twist a matchstick. Okay, that's kind of important. Uh, You know, because most people think of matchsticks as, you know, the paper matches we've used for decades. But back at this time, and this was probably sometime in the early 1940s when this occurred, matchsticks were all wooden at that time. So you have to think what the terminology they're using in the article. How do you twist a matchstick? Yeah. You know, especially those wooden ones. That'd be rather difficult to twist it in the terms we think of. I mean, was it snapped over? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, how was it destroyed? So I had to think about that. Right. Um, the wood had separated into individual fibers. The bark hung in tatters. Now, I can tell you, um, in, in the Bluff Creek region, you know, not, not more than, you know, maybe a mile from where Patterson got his film in 1967. I did a lot of uh, searching of that region for years. And I did find, now I'd found, of course, you know, snap trees in Washington State and Oregon, but... In Northern California, I found a, uh, a pine tree in, in just like this one. It was in the middle of a stand of these younger trees that were probably 10, 12 feet tall, about three inches thick, their, their trunks. And at seven feet mm-hmm. off the ground, I found one right in the center of this group that was twisted, just like you would wring a wash rag out, like he describes here how the, the fibers were separated, hanging in tatters. I found one exactly. Yeah, like it was kind of like ribbons. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was it was kind of unreal seeing something like that. I mean, you, you I, I don't recall if I had read this story at that point, but when I read this story, I'm like, holy cow, that's exactly what we found. So let's move on. Right. Um, okay. <clears throat> he says uh, Stickman and his hunters stood back while Tex and I looked the site over. Moose often ride a sapling down to get at the tender upper twigs. So do caribou. But no moose or caribou had done this. This had been done with something by, by something with hands. It had happened yesterday because the leaves of the sapling had not yet completely wilted. It wasn't the work of lightning, no burns. A freak whirlwind hadn't done it because trees and brush a few yards distant were undamaged. Same thing we found. Only this tree in the center of maybe... There were maybe 15 or 20 of these little trees in this cluster. Only the center one was damaged like that. Um, yeah, that's the way you need to look at it. You need to you need to rule out every possibility. Wind damage, snow load, tree rot. You need to rule all of that stuff out before you jump to the conclusion old Sasquatch did it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so he says, uh, the hard ground showed no tracks. We found no snagged hair in the brush, absolutely nothing except the incredibly twisted birch sapling. It was without question the eeriest sight I'd ever beheld in the wilds. Stickman said, it is Gilliac's mark, we've seen it before. I wish to make clear that the Dena people, Gilliac was no legendary creature. Their grandfathers had told them about it was reality. They had spoke of him as they spoke of bears and wolves. They saw his sign and they saw him. He was a shaggy giant who wore a little hat and ate men. We want to ask you to camp with us until we have killed our caribou, Stickman said. Gilliac doesn't molest white men. Perhaps he will not molest you, or he will not molest us if you are in the camp. Well, that's reasonable thinking. Um, no. Stickman had already told us that he had bivouacked on the shore of a pothole lake two hours to the east. Tex said, all right, we'll move, the, we'll move to his camp in the morning. As he spoke, he was still looking around at the twisted sapling. His green eyes narrowed in thought. I couldn't take my gaze off it either. Stickman said, thanks, Kosaki. Uh, a strange word of respect held over from the old Russian Cossack. We had parted company with the Indians. Next morning, I brought the horses in at daybreak. We ate, broke camp, and, put, and putting on the packs... When here came the Indians, all of them, all, that is except Stickman. 
An old man told us that they were returning to their camp or to their town on Tyrone Lake. Stickman was dead. He said Gilliak had taken him. The chief had got up in the night and gone down to the lake, perhaps for water. But nobody knew. Uh, a squaw with a birch bark torch had found his red flannel underwear on the gravel beach. It had been torn off him. There may have been tracks, but the, the entire hunting party had swarmed over the beach, and by daylight, no tracker on earth could have made sense of the jumble. Well, until the day of his own death last July, while on a sentimental journey to a grateful, a fateful spot uh, in Cook Inlet, Tex was convinced that the cannibal giant Gillick had killed Stickman. When asked if he believed the existence of the abominable snowman, Tex would reply that he didn't think there were any around Alaska nowadays, but they had existed, at least one of them, a couple of decades back. So, fascinating story. Um... And it's very it, much so. It, you know, it made me when we when I first started finding this stuff back in 1991. You know, after talking to Bob <laughs> Titmus and he showed me the things he'd found. You know, in Bluff Creek, uh, and we began finding these really dramatic signs. And now our field work, uh, every time we find these, that's an area of act, current activity. So, um, the creatures is something they apparently do do. Well, one thing I've always told people to look for if they ever see, like, tree snaps or anything like that is wherever the break is, look above that and see if you can see where there's any barkness and where the hand would have been gripping it. Because to 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 snap a tree and twist it like they do, they're going to have to have a good grip, and you're going to be able to see where their hand was where it rubbed off the bark. Right, good advice. And that's something that I look for myself also. And, uh, and oftentimes you do find that where the, the pressure of the hand is, you know, where they grip the yeah. tree. Well, folks, we'll just put that in your basket. Let us know what you think. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.